Good morning, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the Blue Angel show that we arranged for you for today. Um, so Chicago tax liens, and it, we, we sometimes feel like this is a little bit of a whirlwind. Um, I see the majority of people here we, uh, we know from GFI, from um, Leanalytics, from a number of our other companies, and they're going to be in and out today, so I'll try to talk over them. Um, but, the, uh, but the topic for today, uh, or the, the theme for today, is really specifically uh, Illinois tax lands, right? Uh, but before we dive into a lot of our incredible speakers that are going to be looking at the, uh, the auction process, that are going to be looking at data, that are going to be looking at uh, what happened this year in the county, we like to take a step back at these events and, and look at the industry overall, because that's really how we, uh, that's really how we view the tax lien universe, is in an incredibly, an incredibly holistic way. And at BCMG, we're, we're very much a family of companies that service all across uh, the life of a property tax lien. We don't buy liens ourselves like almost everybody in, in the room here. Um, but what we do is try to provide a suite of services uh, to help you, to help empower you as investors or as service providers to see deeper into your, uh, to your assets, to provide liquidity in the secondary market, perhaps to provide a little bit of product in the secondary market that you don't have, um, et cetera. So in, in that uh, vein of thought, um, we're going to talk about the lean industry overall, the health of the lean industry, because that is a very, very uh, tough topic, <laughs> I think, these days um, at, our, at our national conference and then at the, uh, the National Tax Lean Association uh, national conference. We're all going to be talking a little bit about um, some of the, the issues that we face as an industry and as investors in the property tax lien industry. Um, but there's all kinds of good things as well. Uh, so. We're all relatively familiar with this, and, and we'll circulate, we'll circulate these, uh, these slides afterwards. And they're always available on taxlingtalk.com. Um, but at, at the very heart and the very core of what we do as an industry, uh, it's important to remember that we're supporting communities with our dollars, right? Um, we're monetizing a piece of the balance sheet that Goldman and JP Morgan and these other investment banks aren't able to monetize through the issuance of GO bonds or, or any other kind of more traditional municipal uh, financing and municipal debt. And we're, we're monetizing kind of a, a small little piece of the balance sheet in a very meaningful way when you look at it in aggregate across the 29 states and DC that, that sell property tax leads. So how do communities spend their dollars, right? Um, you'll see that property taxes uh, over, over the, uh, the entire United States, when we, we break it up between the Northeast, Midwest, West, and South, uh, they vary from you know, a small amount, 0.2% uh, in, the, in the Northeast, all the way up to 2.7% in the mid Midwest where we are here now. So the significance is, is a little bit different. Uh, and this, by the way, is according to the 2014 census, I think? 2014 census for, um, from the US government. But there is meaningful, uh, meaningful cash at stake here. So where does the money come from? Again, property tax is this small little sliver overall, right? So it's oftentimes overlooked by, uh, oftentimes overlooked by investment bankers, et cetera, which is part of what we, uh, part of what we um, enjoy as property tax lien investors is we kind of, we get to fly under the radar a little bit. Um, trends, we are trending up both in, uh, in property tax revenue and, uh, and, and also again, um, after a precipitous decline in, in, uh, in housing values. But over our entire industry, tax lien, uh, tax lien volumes, both by, uh, both by dollar value and by number of liens, are much lower than they have been historically. So here's your top five, your bottom five property taxes, just to kind of give you an example of where we are here in Illinois. We're not quite in the top five in terms of, uh, in terms of dollar value at 3,500 bucks, um, but pretty close and, and very, very far from, uh, very far from the bottom five. Um, so that's where taxes go. That's kind of where we fit in this broad capital market structure, et cetera. But, but where are we in terms of property taxing investors as an asset class? Um, and, Oftentimes when people come into this space or when large hedge funds in New York, when we go up to our New York office, ask us, you know, where, where does this fit? Draw an analogy for me. It's difficult, uh, it's difficult to talk in terms of the bond market right away. So we like to draw an analogy to the stock market, right? 
So everybody knows what an IPO is, initial public offering for, for a stock, right? So if we look at you know, this top portion of, of the graphic here as a public IPO for equities, Microsoft, Google, any of these large names that, uh, that you know in this IPO marketplace, go to marketplaces like the New York Stock Exchange, now owned by ICE, but the, the NYSE or NASDAQ or the American Stock Exchange or historically over time, any one of the, the large stock exchanges in order to offer equity in their company out to the broader marketplace for sale, right? And these are large publicly traded stocks, lots of liquidity, typically, um, and very, very deep balance sheets. So that's the public IPO that we all talk about and watch on CNBC and, and talk about the publicly traded stocks. Now, beneath that, in the equities market, there is a private shares market. And I'm sure that over the past five, six years, as this marketplace has become more and more robust, everybody has heard about you know, the face, pre, you know, pre-IPO Facebook shares, right? Remember when Second Market was making markets and, and trading, uh, was trading shares in Facebook before it went to the broader marketplace through a public IPO? Well, Second Market, um, and we know Barry pretty well, um, Second Market was kind of a pioneer in this private shares marketplace, but they're everywhere now. LiquidNet is a huge private shares, um, private shares trading company. Shares Post down here. NASDAQ now owns 5% of Shares Post, right? So, so what is a private shares market? Well, it means that you can trade equity in these companies before it goes onto an IPO, right? And we don't need to, uh, we don't need to get into all the details and, and the nitty gritty. I'm happy to with anybody that, that's interested afterwards because it's, it's kind of a fascinating, cool thing. But the point of this slide is that there's this small niche undersung market that's oftentimes very misunderstood that exists beneath all of these public IPOs for the equities market, right? Similarly, there is this small niche market, tax liens, that exists in the bond market underneath all of the large exchanges. Now, bonds are not traded on exchanges, as we know, right? But there are large OTC conglomerates, right? Bonds.com that was actually recently purchased, so we should probably change that. Uh, uh, the ERSA and large, large municipal bond warehouses, right, will aggregate pools of liquidity of these things and will trade them across the United States. Now, these are big corporate bonds. These are municipal bonds, et cetera. But this is the debt market. So just like equities with the IPO and then with the, the, uh, the private shares market, we have all of these municipal bonds offered out everywhere on every single Bloomberg screen across the world. And then we've got this little tax lien marketplace, right? That little niche from those, uh, from those slides from, um, from before. And so we, uh, you know, we have a couple players in the marketplace now. There used to be more. There was some consolidation. We purchased one of the firms. Another one went out of business. Um, but we have, you know, we have a fairly commanding market share uh, at, at one of our holding companies, which is Blockstrade, in the secondary market. But I show, you this, I show you this to illustrate the fact that liens are significant, and they contribute to the fixed income market in, in a very, very interesting way. And we don't need to get into capital markets. You, got, you guys all know um, how capital markets work. But, again, to put it in perspective, here's the size of all the fixed income marketplaces as of probably 2013. Uh, and we've represented them in, size, in, in terms of these, these lovely bubbles here. But tax liens, right, uh, we put in about $10 billion in new issuance a year. Um, tax liens are just a small little piece, right? Treasuries are enormous. Asset-backed securities come and go, depending on uh, your opinion on asset-backed securities. But corporates are enormous, right? But we do fit into this really, really interesting fixed income world. Um, and we're growing. So let's talk about the primary versus secondary. So the primary marketplace for property tax liens is defined as what just happened last week in Cook County, right? Direct issuance of liens through whatever auction process is enabled by the state statute, direct from the county or the taxing jurisdiction right to you as investors. So in the primary marketplace in 2014, and, and, and uh, nobody really knows, by the way, what the actual number, uh, the dollar figure of property tax liens issued in any one year is. The NTLA has done some interesting studies. We did studies in a clearing company I used to own. But we put it right at about $9 billion for last year. Uh, 2015, unfortunately, for, for all of us here, um, on the secondary and in the primary market, 
Um, 2015, we anticipate, will be a little bit lower issuance uh, of about $7 billion to the public market. There's some private transactions, too. Um, so unfortunately, it's trending down. It'll go back and forth. It's very cyclical. Uh, but the secondary market, um, in a formal institutionalized way, we see is growing quite steadily, quite rapidly. Um, in 2014, uh, we traded about $250 million in the formal secondary market last year. Uh, and, and we were responsible for about $225 million out of that um, at, at Blocks Trade. And in 2015, we should probably revise this to the downside because uh, the last few months weren't as, weren't as big. Uh, but we actually anticipate trading about $1.25, not, not $1.75 billion in property tax liens in the secondary market. So as you can see, there's kind of an inverse correlation. When people can't get enough liens in the primary market, they want to turn to the secondary market to be able to, uh, to buy and sell these property tax liens. So what the heck is the secondary market for, for liens? And why do you guys care? Uh, so the first part of that, answering those questions, is who benefits, right? So issuers, that is the taxing jurisdictions, they, they benefit from the secondary market because they're able to raise more capital, right? When you show liquidity in any marketplace, when you go to your bankers at Wells Fargo and Capital One and uh, all the other banks that, that you guys use for leverage, um, they want to see one thing. They are on the phone with me all the time, right? They want to see one thing. They want to see depth in a the marketplace. They want to see a liquidity in the marketplace, right? So when things go bad and there's a default or the principles they don't like anymore, et cetera, they want to be able to sell it into a market at a fair price and not a fire sale rate, right? So this helps issuers be able to raise capital um, by, uh, by the existence of a, uh, a secondary market because there's cash out there, right? So it supports infrastructure on the municipal level and it also funds operations, right? So who are the buyers? That's all you. Right? Um, a lot of you in here are actually clients of a number of our different companies, including Blockstrade, the secondary market here. And so for you, you have access to unique investments. Right? You have liens that are not available anywhere else by, by virtue of the fact that someone else holds them. And liens are kind of like little diamonds. Uh, the, there's only one of any of them. Right? And so if you want that one lien, you have to go to the person that holds it. And we try to be facilitators through a secondary market um, to give access to that person that holds it. Uh, in the secondary market, you also have objective data. Uh, that's a little bit different than primary because as we can all appreciate, it's difficult to go around and aggregate this information. There's a number of very, very um, great quality uh, data providers, um, some of which are, are partnered with us, some of which we own, um, that provide data in the primary market, but it's expensive, it's clunky, and you have to research 10, 20, 50 times more liens than you actually purchase in order to, uh, in order to get what you want. In the secondary market, the data is done for you, there's objective data, and it's typically paid for by, uh, by the issuing party or by the, by the facilitator, by the broker. Um, and the good thing, or one of the, the good things about the secondary market is there's immediate availability of liens. So in the primary market, you have to wait around and if you miss out on Cook County this year, if you didn't do very well in Cook County this year, you get to lament that fact for an entire year before you have the, the, the honor and the privilege uh, of buying Cook County liens again. In the secondary market, you can buy them at any time as long as they're, you know, as long as they're on the marketplace. So buyers, it's very apparent. We need products. Boom. Move, go to the secondary market. It's very advantageous to you. So why would anybody sell anything? What are the benefits to the sellers? Well, you get to maximize your liquidity. What if there's uh, some kind of catastrophic event and you need some kind of liquidity, right? Okay, that's more on the distress side, but you can also use liquidity to your advantage to rebalance, um, to rebalance capital accounts and capital lines, right? To move in and out of different funds. We actually have a number of different funds now. The number's over five funds out of our 400 institutional clients that actively trade liens. They buy liens with the intent of reselling liens. And for me, this is an enormous victory because I've been talking, standing on my little soapbox, talking about this for like four years. Uh, but, uh, but, but people actually are buying liens to resell them. Now, this is not this is not the NASDAQ. This is not high frequency trading. We're not getting in and out of liens, you know, on a, on a second by second or even a day by day or even a weekly basis, right? I'm talking about 30 day, 60 day holds, et cetera. But you can actually arbitrage the taxing market, which is, which is kind of a cool thing. Um, 
Sellers have complete control. You don't have to take a price that a buyer gives you, right? In any marketplace, you have complete control as a seller as to whether you want to accept bids. Um, and then you do also have analysis on your own portfolio, whether it's sold or not, you have the data that the listing broker gives you, which is kind of cool because that's free, and uh, it gives you a little bit of insight into your portfolio. But more important than that, what you have is market pricing. Regardless of whether you accept a bid or not, you have a, a, an opinion, really, of what the marketplace thinks of your portfolio, which is, very, uh, which is very crucial to anybody looking for liquidity or trying to make a case to the risk officers or trying to get another credit line at a bank or explain themselves to, to their investors. So how did we get here? Um, the history of the tax lien marketplace, uh, and, and it goes way back. I mean, tax liens are a feudal concept. We borrowed this from, we borrowed this from, uh, from uh, ancient uh, Western Europe. But in the beginning, the tax lien market uh, was characterized by localized small buyers, right? So everybody would fund each other. We'd come to these small communities and we'd say, all right, my neighbor didn't pay his taxes. I'm going to go ahead in and pay, uh, you know, pay those on his behalf and earn a relatively attractive, uh, relatively attractive yield. And so that went on for quite some time, unknown to the institutional market. Then, you know, in, in uh, the late 80s, early 90s, down uh, up into the two, early 2000s, banks said, hey, look at this stuff. This is great paper. And they started throwing around these great buzzwords like, amazing risk adjusted returns and arbitrage and the ability to, to offer leverage on these things, right? So large banks and wirehouses uh, came in, we all know the stories, came in and started aggregating these in bulk, right? This became an institutionalized product. Um, then what we saw right around when I started getting into the marketplace um, was middle market players being empowered by leverage in banks, right? A lot of these wirehouses and these large banks have gotten out of the equity side of the marketplace. A lot of headline risk, things didn't go so well in the capital markets. Um, Jamie Dimon said, why are we foreclosing in, on the tax lien side when, we're, uh, when we've got the, the mortgage side on the other side that owns a mortgage on the same property? Um, but so middle market funds empowered by leverage from some of these very same wirehouses and some other um, enterprising uh, lending institutions came out and said, all right, we can go do this. We can get cheap money. Leverage is good. This is a great, again, risk-adjusted return. And this is, uh, this is kind of a cool marketplace where we're collateralized and we like it. So we saw the emergence of a number of, uh, a number of our clients out of this. And it really started to dominate the marketplace in terms of, uh, in terms of market share. Um, and then with the maturation of any marketplace anywhere from like coins to wine to municipal bonds to the stock market from back in the Buttonwood Agreement back on you know the old original Water Street uh, you have a secondary market that comes now we don't pretend like we're the first people to ever think of a secondary market idea people have been talking about this for way longer than, than we've been in the business um, but for some reason we were the first when I was at GFI to be able to actually codify a secondary market um, and, and make it work and it was hard uh, and it was super clunky and it's gotten a little better we made a tremendous amount of mistakes but in 2010 February 2010 the first real successful institutional marketplace was was formed um, and it was as Stephen mentioned the, the DART platform distressed asset receivable trading platform um, at, uh, at GFI Group, which was one of the, the largest interdealer brokers uh, on the street, just bought by BGC, Howard Lutnick. Um, so we ran that for a bit. It was fun. We made a lot of mistakes. We had a lot of clients. We moved a lot of paper. Um, everybody made some money. We were happy. Uh, then comes consolidation, not just in the secondary market, not just um, with BCMG and our family of companies, um, but across everywhere in the marketplace. We're talking banks consolidating. We're talking uh, tax lien servicers consolidating. We're talking large institutional buyers consolidating. And we continue to see this today. And I mean, just uh, put your, set your Google News alerts to property tax liens, and you're going to see XYZ company bought out, right? XYZ company acquired, right? So, so we're seeing consolidation across the property tax lien universe, not just in service-oriented companies, because they need to try to stay afloat with these compressing yields and, uh, and clients that don't want, to pay, uh, don't want to pay spreads that are as large, but in the asset class itself. 
And with the rise of a lot of the securitizations, um, you're seeing consolidation on kind of the, the AAA, AA, and maybe B type paper. And then on the servicing organizations, you're definitely seeing consolidation of resources. So uh, it's kind of interesting. We've got all kinds of funny stories, as I'm sure you do, about, uh, about many of these transactions over the past uh, two or three years. But um, where we see the future uh, is in Access Terminal. And, and, and Access Terminal is basically Bloomberg for tax lands, right? And while Access is a brand that BCMG owns, uh, the idea of Access Terminal is that we want to be able to offer out uh, uh, a central marketplace for everything that's not just our companies. We want to prime the pump um, on the secondary market side with Blockstrade because somebody's got to go first. That's fine. But we welcome Lumentum to come in, and, and we're negotiating with them to come in. We welcome other small local brokers to come in, right? We want a centralized marketplace where everybody competes in this wonderful capitalistic way. We think that's good for the market. Um, similarly, I guess I should go to Access Terminal. Uh, similarly, we want to do the same thing with data, right? Uh, with TSR, with Lumentum Data, with CoreLogic, with LPS, with all of these large data providers along with our brand, Leanalytics. Um, we, so Access Terminal gives uh, this central, central location for all of these service providers to be able to compete in a very open and transparent way to better serve you as, uh, as clients, right? And, and that is the ultimate goal, is that these service providers are not able to be the best at everything at all times. And it, as investors, and I used to run a small fund, but as investors, it's, very, it's often difficult, especially if you go across states, to choose one service provider that you like for everything. Because they're really good at these things, and they're really, really terrible at these things over here, right? So wouldn't it be nice if you can go to one centralized place and pick and choose the service providers that are good for this part of your business based on, uh, based on your criteria and based on their performance? That's the whole concept here. So in an open and transparent market like Access Terminal or anywhere else or any other, uh, in any other asset class, who are the players? Um, well, we've got the auction providers. We all know the auction providers, right? Uh, the online auction providers, Real Auction, Grantster Group, SRI, and the like, right? And then there's the auction providers that are much more on a local level, um, some of which is outsourced and some of which is done through the Treasury Departments or the Sheriff Departments. These are the guys that you interface with um, daily in order to purchase your liens in the primary. We've got the seller uh, in the secondary market, that's all of you that want to liquidate your liens. You've got the buyer in the secondary market, that's all of you that want to purchase liens. Uh, you've got the broker, right, that's the person that sits in between, relatively self-explanatory. You've got the issuer, which is the taxing jurisdiction of the municipality. You've got the bankers, um, and I don't necessarily mean the bankers that are giving you leverage on your property tax lien portfolio. I also mean the investment bankers or the investment banker types that are going in, whether it's under that label or uh, another label, that are going in and convincing these municipalities um, to issue these liens in the first place. You've got the marketplace, um, which arguably would be access terminal in the future, right? which is different than an OTC market like, uh, like Lumentum or like Blockstrade have. Uh, you've got data can't make decisions without data. Uh, you have market makers, which is a very interesting concept we're going to talk about in a second, because this is why our marketplace works now much better than it worked um, before we bought it from GFI. And then you've got clearing. The paper's got to get from the seller to the buyer someday, or else nobody gets paid. So how do all over-the-counter, OTC, over-the-counter marketplaces work? Um, municipal bonds started this way, still kind of work this way, fortunately or unfortunately. Uh, most block trading, um, and that is why we call it block trade, most block trading uh, equity firms work this way. Most big, big pools of liquidity of, of any kind of commodities that, that don't really have a tradable, uh, a tradable value work this way. Uh, weather derivatives work this way, which is a really, really interesting business. Wet freight, dry freight, you can go on and on and on. Anything these IDBs move, right? So over-the-counter marketplaces, especially for asset-backed products like property tax liens, work like this. It's not rocket science. Always works the same. So listing at the top, bidding at the bottom. You've got your seller, lists with the broker. The broker puts it on the, well, the broker goes to the data firm to get the data, has to tell everybody about what, what it is that you're selling, goes back to the broker. Broker goes to the marketplace. Pretty easy stuff. And then the bidder, right? So the buyer comes to the marketplace via a broker, and uh, the broker goes to the seller, negotiates back and forth, back and forth with the pricing. 
sometimes you have to use a market maker, right, who is a bidder of last resort, who is a buyer of last resort, to execute the trade. Execute the trade, goes to the clearing office, the clearing office goes to these little municipalities, moves the paper, comes back, trade's done. So that's how, that's how over-the-counter marketplaces work. So the idea with access is that it's all of the players, all these different players in the market, all of this over-the-counter process in one portal and one place. And we can do demos and show you this stuff. This is not meant to be a, a commercial necessarily for, for Access Terminal, but we use it as, a, use it as an example as to how uh, a very inefficient marketplace can be consolidated in all of the players and all of the, uh, the institutional investors on the buy and the sell side can be serviced in one place, right? So an example of how one might use this uh, in your normal business, and we recognize most people don't care as much about secondary market trading as they do about primary. It's not your normal business. We get that. We can be a supplement and an add-on to, uh, to, to people's normal business. But the access terminal services your entire business, right? Primary market, due diligence, servicing, all of that fun stuff plugs in all your service providers. So you select your auction, um, and I recognize with the light here, it's probably a little difficult to see because we do have a black screen like Bloomberg because for all of us have, who have sat up for 48 hours at a time staring at a screen flipping through Florida, uh, Florida leans for due diligence, you can appreciate not having a white screen. Um, so you can select your auction, you narrow your auction results, and by the way, you can pipe in data providers as many as you possibly want, right? And if you have a data provider that you like that we don't have, let us know. We'll pipe them in via API, right? So you filter your auction results. You've got all kinds of cool heat maps. You can filter, sort, save your preferences, et cetera. You can give your banks transparency into this, which is actually kind of nice. You can look at borrowing bases. Uh, you choose your liens. Uh, you research your parcels one by one. And again, this is all data that's populated from a number of different data sources, whichever ones you'd like to subscribe to. Uh, you, can, you can click and order photos right on here, sends people out to the field, all kinds of interesting things. Um, and then in the secondary market, just like you can today, uh, you can buy and sell, you can share this with investors, share these with banks, et cetera, right from a centralized screen across brokers, right? No matter who your broker is, you can go on this one screen and see everything that's available in the marketplace. Um, and then, of course, we all need to transfer liens, right? So a lot of this happens behind the scenes, but you can actually track and see step by step how your liens are being transferred, what stage they're in, what stage of documentation they're in, uh, what stage of, of notarization they're in, whether the counties received them, whether they've been validated, when they were redeemed, if they were redeemed, all of that fun stuff. Um, and so that, that basically takes you through the entire life of the property tax lien, right? From birth, purchase in the primary, due diligence, re-diligencing it if you want to do something like apply for, uh, apply for a TDA or you know, file a foreclosure lawsuit, et cetera. Um, depending on the different state, different jurisdiction, it's, it adjusts for that. And then being able to take it through liquidity, whether it's selling it, buying it, clearing it, et cetera. So um, that's how the access terminal is, is kind of built to service this marketplace. Um, but really, I'd, I'd like to open it up for questions about how the tax lien market is overall how we fit into kind of this whole capital markets thing, any of the players, um, or any of the, this general overview that, that we've just given, and then we'll give it over to, to all of the, the Illinois professionals so they can talk about um, Illinois-specific things. Questions? Yes? How do you come up with the price? How do you come up with the Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was, how do you come up with the prices on the secondary market? Um, it was really hard. <laughs> uh, it, in the beginning, in the beginning, um, we tried to price some kind of like cash bonds in the cash bond market. That didn't really work. Uh, then, then you need to you need to pinpoint one specific uh, metric that you can price bid and ask spreads off of. So we said redemptive value. This is a universal concept, right? It's calculated differently depending on the state that you're in, but redemptive value is a universal concept everybody understands. Investors understand it, banks understand it, auditors understand it. Um, so your redemptive value uh, is basically your face value plus your accrued interest. It's what you would be paid today if that lien redeemed, right? So we call that par. We call that 100 cents in the dollar. So if you were to buy a million dollar portfolio 
um, that had 10% of accrued interest, right? You'd buy a $1.1 million portfolio at redemptive value at 100 cents on the dollar. Those are all synonymous. We're saying the same thing. So we price it based on that RV. Recognize RV is a moving target, right? Time continues to march on. And again, this is not the NASDAQ. These transactions do not happen overnight, right? These transactions are clunky. Uh, they're much better than they used to be. Uh, but they do take some time. We've introduced efficiencies, but they take some time. So redemptive value moves along. So we have to peg it off of this moving target. So when you come in and bid in the secondary market, um, your bidding is a percentage of redemptive value. So you might bid a discount to redemptive value, which probably I would say, you know, 70%-ish of our trades are bid, you know, at a discount to redemptive value. Um, and that just means that you've priced in some kind of risk premium, right? Uh, really what you've priced in is three things. Uh, any discount to redemptive value is probably uh, a product of some kind of risk premium because you say, all right, I didn't buy these originally. I might not know everything about it, right? Uh, then the second thing you've priced in is some kind of liquidity premium, right? How liquid is this particular product? If this is brand new quarter point Florida uh, liens, there's probably a very low liquidity premium. You could sell this stuff at any time. It's kind of a homogeneous pro uh, product. Whereas if this is a ginormous, you know, South Carolina lien, you guys are in South Carolina right now, ginormous South Carolina lien with a huge overbid right, and a lot of concentration risk in a tiny county in the middle of um, a little bit more esoteric state, uh, maybe the liquidity premium is going to be higher. So, so you bid at a discount to the redemptive value. Um, or sometimes people will bid at a, a premium to redemptive value, much more these days than you would think. And there's a number of different reasons people would do this, but as long as you don't bid at too high of a premium and then everything redeems the next day, Really what you're doing is you're just making an assumption about the redemption curve of, of those liens, and then you're bidding according to, to that assumption. And, uh, and you're just playing with the interest rate, right? So you price it off of redemptive value. What's the fee? Oh, what's, the, what's the fee for? Your company, whatever company that. Sure. So, so all, yeah, all these service providers charge different fees. Um, in the secondary market, our standard fee is 1.5% to, uh, to the buyer. Um, in, in that case, right? And of course, those are negotiable depending on the, the transaction. Any other questions about the marketplace or secondary market or yields in the, in the lean market overall? No? Everybody's got a good, a good handle on that? Okay. Very good. Well, uh, f we really appreciate you guys coming. Um, we, uh, we have an excellent, excellent lineup of speakers. And let's learn a little bit more about Chicago. Turn it back over to Stephen.